Thank you all for coming tonight to what is going to be a fascinating discussion on a fascinating topic with a fascinating author about a fascinating book. So keep feeling the fascination throughout the evening. The title of this evening's event is taken from the title of the book, Our Enemies Will Vanish, Russia's Invasion and Ukraine's War of Independence by Yaroslav Trofimov, who, as I'm sure you all know from the uh, realms of Twitter, from the realms of traditional media, and indeed from the promotional material for this event, is the chief foreign affairs correspondent for the Wall Street Journal, a Pulitzer Prize finalist in 2023, and the author of three books, the latest of which we're going to be talking about tonight. We stand at a moment where Ukrainian President Zelensky could say just this weekend that unless the US steps up and provides aid to Ukraine, Ukraine will lose the war in also a not so subtle commentary on Europe's willingness and ability to step in and fill that gap. The stakes could not be higher, but still we see our understanding of Ukraine riddled with misperceptions, misconceptions, and miscalculations. Yaroslav Trofimov has done us a service by bringing together things, stories, emotional stories that touch the heart together with analysis that touches the head in order to address some of those misconceptions and to make clear from the level of the individual to the geopolitical, what are the stakes involved in this conflict, why we need to act and what we can actually do. And so we're going to explore some of the book's content uh, tonight in conversation, first of all with Yaroslav and then with three excellent panelists we have joining us, Francisca Davis, Ralph Fuchs and Stefan Meister, who will come on stage after the first part of the discussion between Yaroslav and I. Uh, and then we will open up to your questions in the last third of the event. So do please think of the concise, potent and punchy questions that you would like to ask in this in-person event. So, Starting with the book's title, Yaroslav, Our Enemies Will Vanish. Can you tell us a little bit about that and also what it's like for such a well-traveled foreign correspondent and war reporter to cover a war that takes place at home? Uh, thank you so much for this introduction. Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, the book's title uh, is a line from the Ukrainian national anthem. Uh, and the anthem was written in the 1860s when there was no country called Ukraine. When the Ukrainian language, uh, culture, education, you know, printing of books in Ukrainian were banned uh, by the Russian Empire. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the very idea of a Ukrainian statehood seemed like an impossible dream. And yet, you know, over time, uh, Ukraine did manage to achieve independence. First in the early 20th century, that failed. And then again uh, in 1991. <clears throat> and that Ukrainian state, fragile as it was, did manage to survive and then withstand this the test of this war, the war that uh, many people, most people probably, <clears throat> uh, in the Russian government and in Western governments uh, thought would end with a swift Russian victory and uh, so the extinguishing of the Ukrainian statehood. Uh, this line in the anthem goes, uh, you know, our enemies will vanish like dew at sunrise, which is quite a poetic way of wishing the disappearance of your enemies, but it, it in a way it conveys the spirit uh, in which Ukraine faced this war, and the spirit was that we just want to be left alone. Like we want to be allowed to decide how our country develops, you know, which way it faces, uh, independently of what Russia desires. Uh, and so it wasn't. It's 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 a war that was fought for that is being fought for that. It's a, it's a war fought for just being allowed to be, you know, as it says in the anthem, you know, one day we'll come, we'll be the masters in our own homeland. You know, Ukraine never desired any, any new territory of its neighbors. And uh, so when it came to me, um, you know, I've spent most of my 20, now five years at the Wall Street Journal covering wars and mayhem, uh, usually uh, in other people's countries. So I spent a lot of time in Iraq. Uh, I was uh, our bureau chief in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And, uh, you know, all, all of those were uh, difficult assignments. And obviously, you make friendships, you feel, you know, a lot of empathy uh, for the people there. But it's never the same as when it's a war in a country where you were born, when the city where you have. You grow up where every piece of geography has you know, a huge emotional meaning to you. 
you know, memories of your childhood uh, uh, is under attack. You know, I remember you know, walking down you know, the street in Kiev, uh, which used to be packed with cars. You couldn't, you couldn't park there uh, on February 23rd. It was abandoned. You could, you could hear this thud of artillery uh, in the distance as the Russians were closing in. And I, you know, I was wearing a flag jacket uh, and body and, and a helmet. And I realized that you know I've worn this you know war outfit so many times in so many war zones, but I never thought I would have to wear it in Kiev. And it did feel like an insult, and it did feel like uh, a sort of a very personal. And what do you do with that? And I think uh, one of the uh, differences for me in doing in covering the war in Ukraine was that I. I took more risks because I, I think I felt that uh, this combination of being able to relate this story to readers in America, you know, in the world, and also to relate to the story, to understand the story. So the ability to you know, speak the language, know the culture, uh, languages, uh, and the culture, and kind of have this visceral understanding of the society, uh, put me in in a rare position. And so uh, they gave me a sense of mission. So I, I think I, you know, pushed further, spent more time in the front lines, did more dangerous things, just because I, you know, I, uh, it felt like it had a purpose. And it's it's very rare as a writer, or as a journalist, to uh, see the direct connection uh, to what you do, because you write something into the void. Maybe it impresses people. Maybe it doesn't. Uh, but I met so many people in Ukraine uh, who came to Ukraine because of something they've read, something they've seen on television. Uh, and a lot of them have not had any prior experience with Ukraine, have never been there. And they were so moved by the stories from Ukraine that they either came to, you know, bring humanitarian aid, some came to fight for Ukraine, some came as medics, and uh, abandoning their, you know, their, their careers, their families, their lives in America and Europe. Uh, and on the higher level, I think the idea that Ukraine was fighting and showing how Ukraine was fighting, but also showing how Ukrainians, you know, it's not some sort of exotic war. I mean, Ukrainians are just like the readers, you know, they have, of, of what I was writing for the book, uh, for the paper, you know, they had the same hopes, the same aspirations, the same problems, the same fears, uh, and just... And I was trying to de-exoticize de de and just show the universality of, of this crisis and this conflict. And it, the book succeeds in doing that. I can tell you, warn you perhaps, that reading the book uh, is a truly visceral experience. You are taken to the places where this is happening and you experience the, the things that are going on with the people there. It's, it's a horrible cliche, but I really couldn't put it down to the extent that I knew I had to take a big car journey uh, at the time I was reading the book. And so I bought the audiobook version as well and was listening to this. But unfortunately, as I got to chapters five, six, and seven around what happens in Hostomel, I had to stop the car because it was all getting a little much to, to actually do justice to safe driving and to pay attention to the events that were I was hearing about at the same time. And this this notion that Ukrainians are, are people like us fighting for things that we care about too, this war of self-determination, a war for freedom too, as you say, to be left alone. That is certainly something that resonated. And I think the public upswell of opinion and support for Ukraine certainly helped push Western leaders to do more. But perhaps you could tell us a bit about that, because this is also covered a lot in the book, the role of Western aid to Ukraine, the difference it made and the differences it didn't. Yeah. Uh, well, I, th I think coming back to this issue of, uh, you know, uh, hitting the emotional notes, I think in the book I'm quoting the Ukrainian foreign minister, uh, Dmitry Koleba, who was saying that it's very rare that in the history of international relations, morality, moral issues, the moral appeal of a cause influences decisions of policymakers. Because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, people are very cynical. Uh, and yet uh, here, somehow the Ukrainian struggle struck such a chord in Western societies in part because of Zelensky, President Zelensky very successfully appealing over the heads of politicians to the publics in the West, that it actually moved policy. So governments in Europe and the US felt compelled to act and to give more to the to the Ukrainian cause than they initially planned to, wanted to, because of this pressure from the public opinion, at least in the first weeks and months of the war. But uh, 
obviously, a lot of that help was conditioned by fear of Russia, uh, fear of Russian nuclear retaliation. You know, President Putin, you know, in his uh, morning address announcing the war, uh, the special military operation, as he called it, he did say, you know, you will see the, the the consequences that you have never seen before in your lifetimes if you dare to interfere with my plan. And it was successful in throttling uh, the assistance, not stopping it, but throttling it to a level that prevented a Russian defeat in Ukraine. And you know, the one analogy I hear a lot now in Ukraine as people look back, uh, take stock of what happened is that there was a fire and to extinguish a fire, you need a bucket of water. And yes, Ukraine received you know, tens of billions of dollars in assistance, it received a lot, it received a bucket, but it received it over two years in little coffee cups. It got a bucket full of water, but in espresso sized serving. Exactly, exactly. And that, and that I think is a really good analogy of why you know, uh, the effect of that aid was a lot smaller than it would have been otherwise. But nonetheless, it did make a difference, and it was a real uh, pushback against those. We all remember Sam Charup, for example, who wrote before the war that Western weapons would make no difference to helping Ukraine. So it showed what we could do, mm -hmm. but now there seems to be a danger that we're falling back again. Rather than Ukraine's enemies vanishing, it seems its friends are perhaps vanishing. Well, I, I think what we're seeing is a divergence uh, between Europe and the U.S. You know, initially, it was the U.S. Uh, that led the response. And, and Europe kind of followed suit. You know, I'm talking about the big countries in Europe, obviously countries like Poland and the Baltic states, especially Poland, were, uh, you know, very rapid in providing uh, military assistance to Ukraine when the war began. But uh, now, uh, as, as the war is in its third year, and it's as, as Ukraine has become a very divisive political issue in the United States, uh, the geography is asserting itself and the fact is that you know for the american homeland uh security for the safety of you know an ordinary you know president of pennsylvania or, or wisconsin it doesn't really matter who's in charge in kharkiv probably even in kiev but for europeans it does and uh you know the national security of the european union member states uh is very much uh, depending on, what, on the outcome of the war in Ukraine, as President Macron of France has said, it's an existential war for Europe and for France. And so, as American military basically you know, came to a halt because of political considerations in the US, we now are seeing the Europeans finally waking up and finally starting to to realize that you know if it you know if they don't get their act together then their own safety is at risk their own prosperity is at risk but obviously it's happening very slowly and a lot of time has been wasted so what do you think is driving that consistent slowness then you mentioned fear of escalation um perhaps susceptibility to russian blackmail of various kinds including nuclear blackmail but what else is at play here i think the biggest is the failure of imagination you know just like european leaders could not imagine that Russia would invade Ukraine, like many Ukrainians couldn't imagine it either. To be fair, you know, and you know, you had you know senior you know European and German officials in Kiev at the time because they just couldn't believe it would happen. Uh, and so there is still this failure of imagination of what could happen next, what would be the outcome of a Ukrainian defeat, and uh, sort of lack of. Uh, ability to understand that well you know european union countries could be next putin could really test nato militarily uh and war could come to to european countries including germany so that also relates to what you were saying before that these are people like us people who who are experiencing this in Ukraine. And that's something I think Ukrainians have been very keen to show and very capable of showing through social media and through other um, ways of actually demonstrating their similarity. And it was something that struck me, having worked on Ukraine for a long, long time, uh, to hear on the 25th of February, uh, it was Nick Robinson, the BBC's correspondent, standing on the top of a hotel in Kiev, guiding his listeners' eyes around the city, saying, look over this dynamic, vibrant European city. Now, for anyone who's worked in Ukraine and on Ukraine for a long time, that was a different kind of language than had previously been used, referring to it as European, referring to it as lively, dynamic, somewhere you would want to be. And it struck me at that moment that actually there might be something different going on here with the Western reaction to this. And 
what you, what you mentioned before, Yaroslav, as well, comes across very much in the book. The people who are experiencing this are people like us who had plans for Wednesday evening, who had projects to finish by, by Friday, who had kids' dinners to prepare. And in the stories that, of the people that you meet during the, um, the book, that really comes shining through. Tell us maybe a little bit about Maria, the medic, uh, who appears in Chapter 41 and elsewhere around the Battle of Terni, because she was outside of Ukraine, wasn't she? Well, she was actually inside Ukraine when the war began, but uh, so Maria uh, was uh, kind of interested in, in the Ukrainian cause already in 2014. And so her mother, uh, to being you know, a very protective mother, told her, why don't you go to Poland, study in university there, and you'll be safe. So she needed to go to Wroclaw. Uh, she did get a nice job in Poland, uh, but she wanted to come back. And so uh, she returned to Ukraine uh, in late 2021. And uh, when the war began, she uh, joined the military as a medic, but she didn't tell her mother that. She told her mother that she went to be a camp counselor in Western Ukraine with the children who were evacuated you know, from Kiev and other areas. And in fact, her call sign in the unit was uh, camp counselor, Bojata. That's what sort of said on so her flag jacket. So I asked her, like, why does it say camp counselor? <laughs> and uh, it took her uh, eight months uh, to tell her mother what she was really doing. And uh, when she came to Kiev to tell her, uh, she brought uh, medication because she knew her mother would faint, as she did. And being a trained medic, you know, it did help. Uh, and so, uh, and you know, I met I met her during one of the toughest battles, uh, the battle for Terne, uh, which is a city northeast of Liman in 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 Donetsk region, uh, towards I think it was October 2022. You know, the, the, the commander of a battalion was almost killed that day. A bunch of other people were when a Russian bomb hit a school where they were all gathering. And uh, you, fee, you see people like this, you meet people like this uh, all across uh, the Ukrainian military, all across the front lines. And again, this is not new. This is something that started in 2014. And I think the reason why Ukraine was able to fight in the way it did and to be so resilient is because the Ukrainian military, which was non-existent pretty much in 2014, you know, they could barely have one combat brigade to be sent uh, to Donbass and even that brigade lacked uh, batteries uh, for the uh, for its vehicles. You know, businessmen had to put in money to buy batteries in the open market. <clears throat> the infusion of uh, some of Ukraine's brightest people uh, into the military that began then through the volunteer units, through the volunteer organizations helping the military, really transformed the psychology and, and sort of the way the military operates. And so, you know, one of Putin's many misunderstandings of Ukraine, I mean, the biggest one was his idea that Ukrainians are Russians, really, and, you know, the small Western post clique uh, of Zelensky and other sort of CIA appointees, once they removed, you know, they were all rallied to the Russian cause and welcomed the invaders with flowers. That was, you know, the biggest strategic mistake. But the 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 other mistake that was made in the Russian planning was that the Ukrainian army is really a small Soviet army, and the Russian army is a big Soviet army, and a small Soviet army will inevitably lose to a big Soviet army. And he didn't take into account this change in mentality and the inventive and uh, unorthodox ways in which uh, the Ukrainians would fight. You know, in part, it's a result of NATO training, you know, the so-called mission command, et cetera. But I think it's the foundation of that was the fact that the army reflected the society and the society that was built not on fear like the Russian society is now, but society that was built to a great, much greater extent on trust and sort of this belief in a common cause. Right, and establishing that common cause was something that not just people like Maria, but also very rich people in Ukraine came back yeah. from abroad to to fight, and that's detailed in the book as well, um, in in quite some detail. As is the initial approach to the invasion, the approach taken by Valery Zaluzhny and others, which proved highly successful in blunting the first Russian Blyatskrieg, as it came to be known, and the uh, the technical terminology that we'll explain afterwards. Um, um, and indeed, in that first year, this dynamic advantage that Ukraine had, it was winning the adaption battle. It was winning the adaptation battle. Mm -hmm. And come the summer of, or late summer of 2022, as you also really mm -hmm. convey to the reader, there was a sudden push, wasn't there, around Kharkiv, and the Ukrainians were gaining ground day by day. Mm -hmm. 
Right, right. right. So, um, you know, the, the, uh, what Mascari was saying is indeed one of Ukraine's richest men. Uh, so, with Kozemiako, who did abort his uh, skiing vacation in Lech in Austria and rushed back to Ukraine, and uh, he didn't want to join the former military again because he thought that it's too bureaucratic. So, he set up his own battalion that is now a brigade. Uh, that is integrated in chain of command, but you know a lot of his employers, employees, many of whom used to be veterans of the war in Donbas, came to join. And you know, I went with him on his first combat mission. I didn't know it was his first combat mission, so I wouldn't have gone otherwise. Uh, and uh, you know, it was uh, eventful. But then he sort of gained notoriety um, a few months later uh, by securing the Russian border with the Ukraine near Kharkiv. He said he, he was filmed himself sort of walking to the fence, walking to Russia, invading Russia by a few dozen meters, putting a stop sign in the border and saying, no more, you stop sign here, don't come back. Uh, which was one of the iconic moments of that uh, you know, deliberation. But I think uh, if you were looking at to the strength of Ukraine, I think also one other factor that I think was profoundly misunderstood in the West, in the East, is just how much the whole idea of what it means to be Ukrainian has changed, and the idea of Ukrainian nationalism has changed. Because you know, let's be frank: Ukrainian nationalism historically in the '30s and the '40s was a very toxic, uh, often anti-Semitic, uh, sort of blood and soil nationalism of the kind that most nationalisms in Central Europe were at the time. And it was completely reinvented in the '70s and the '80s. Uh, so when in part because so many Ukrainian dissidents were in the same camps in Siberia as Jewish refuseniks and as other uh, sort of freedom fighters in the former Soviet Union. And uh, when Ukraine came into existence, the foundational principle was that, you know, everyone in Ukraine, regardless of you know, religion, race, blood, is a Ukrainian with equal rights as long as they work for the benefit of Ukraine. You know, and uh, I think in the book I'm quoting President Kravchuk, you know, the very first president of Ukraine, who explained it to me, you know, sort of this whole idea. And I think that idea of inclusiveness, which was misunderstood, you know, by lots of people, because I think Putin still had this sort of idea that only ethnic Ukrainians, you know, who eat borscht and, you know, dance Gopak are real Ukrainians and everybody else is not really. Uh, I think this inclusive Ukrainian identity uh, was the source of strength, which is why, you know, there was no cleavage between Russian speakers and Ukrainian speakers when Russia invaded in 2022, uh, which is why Ukraine now has a president who happens to be Jewish, a defense minister who happens to be Muslim, and uh, the head of the armed forces who happens to be ethnically Russian. And that is not really an issue in the, in the nation's politics. Right, and that consolidation of Ukraine's civic nationhood has been one of the stories that I think has been has penetrated the consciousness here in, in Germany, perhaps not to the extent that we would like, but certainly much mm -hmm. more than it was uh, before the war happened. Mm -hmm. um, but going back to that moment, there was, there was a chance in late 2022, when again, Ukraine was winning that adaption battle. Mm -hmm. And we, we blew it in the West, didn't we? By not supplying what Ukraine needed at the time. Yeah, I, th I think in due respect, there is this sense of, uh, of a missed historical opportunity. Because if you look at the balance of power uh, in late summer 2022, Putin, because of his reluctance to admit that his uh, so-called special military operation was not going to plan, was refusing mobilization. The Russian combat strength in Ukraine was down to about 100,000 people. Stretched thin over, you know, many, you know, several hundred thousand kilometers, and Ukraine had a significant manpower advantage. What did not, it, what they did not have, was an advantage in ammunition or in equipment, because nobody would give it modern tanks, nobody would give it uh, aircraft, nobody would give it patriots for air defense. So all the requests for Western uh, equipment that was giving the following years, at the time was dismissed as unrealistic, as impossible, as provocative, as violating Russian red lines. And so when Ukraine, despite all odds, managed to leverage this advantage of manpower to break through Russian lines and have this miracle in uh, Kharkiv and, and take Kherson, it just ran out of steam. It ran out of steam, it just didn't have enough stuff with which to develop its success. And uh, at the same time, you know, Putin, made some of the most explicit nuclear threats he had ever made. You know, he said, I'm not bluffing. <clears throat> I will defend this. I mean, he announced that these territories are now henceforth Russia and, you know, he will defend them. 
uh, with all his might. Ukraine called his bluff and kept going, but uh, and took her son a month later, but could only go so far. And at the same time, he you know, announced the mobilization of you know, three hundred thousand soldiers. Plus, you know, untold tens of thousands of prisoners were recruited in Russian uh, prison camps. And so as a result of that, by the time all this, what the Americans later called Mountain of Steel, was delivered to Ukraine when the German government uh, removed its objections and sent leopards and the martyrs, and when the uh, Americans sent the Bradleys and the strikers, but then it was too late because, you know, the Russian military had... <clears throat> beefed up strength, it was now no longer outmanned by the Ukrainians, and more importantly, you know, it did spend uh, several months uh, digging, you know, minefields and creating fortifications. And so when the Ukrainian launched it offensive, as we all know, it was not a success. No, indeed. And so that missed opportunity, I think, is, is something that will probably come back to haunt us in the West, not only in terms of the cost of Ukrainian lives, but also the cost to our possibility of democratic ordering, the cost to the possibility in the geopolitical context mm -hmm. that we had to actually get something closer to the world that most of us in democratic societies would like to, to shape. Yaroslav, your, your book, as I say, spans the levels from the individual, uh, the very visceral experience of individuals to the geopolitical. So what, what do you think are the stakes for Europe, the West, and the free world of uh, of this fight in Ukraine? Well, I think if we look at history of Russian expansion, uh, both over the centuries and, and, and just now in this conflict, usually once Russia would take over land, it would use its resources to keep going. Uh, so if Russia were to take Ukraine, would mobilize Ukrainians to fight the next battle and would use its resources for the next battle. We've seen it on a small scale in Donbass. You know, before Russia's full scale invasion, you know, pretty much every fighting age male in Donetsk and Luhansk under Russian control was taken off the streets and sent to fight and die in most cases, uh, or many cases in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, Russia would be creating it would be a much, much more dangerous threat, but also an emboldened threat because they would have called the Western Bluff. And I think, uh, the situation has changed dramatically in the last two, two, two years and change because you know, when the U.S. decided to withdraw from Ukraine, its diplomatic personnel uh, in February 2022, the message was that you know, a Russian victory in Ukraine, no matter how tragic it may be for Ukrainians, would not be a defeat of the West. You know, the U.S. gave Ukraine 90 javelins and said good luck with the insurgency for the next 20 years and kind of called it a day at the time. Uh, not expecting the Ukrainian state to survive. Uh, and in fact, you know, at the time, it would have been, if Russia were to win at the time, in fact, it probably would not have been an existential uh, threat to the West. But now, after all these commitments, after, uh, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars spent, after, you know, President Biden and other officials, you know, stood up many, many times saying, we will stay with Ukraine, you know, for as long as it takes, uh, Russia is saying, not altogether incorrectly, that they're fighting against the collective West. Certainly, you know, hundreds of thousands of Russian soldiers were killed or maimed with Western weapons. And the rest of the world would, uh, you know, would definitely see Russia uh, triumphing now because the West decided to walk away from Ukraine, because America decided to walk away from Ukraine, as a Russian victory against the collective West. Uh, and, you know, everyone in the world is watching, China is watching, and the consequences uh, of that, as Macron now says, you know, would be existential, especially for European security. Yes, there's absolutely no guarantee that the West's enemies would vanish should this conflict be frozen or otherwise and not ended without a Ukrainian victory. And this, I mean, what you mentioned just there, so far we seem to have pursued what is an extremely expensive way to damage our reputation and make ourselves less safe. So... How do we actually overcome that is the next question. And to um, to join us in uh, discussing that further, can I please welcome to the stage Francisca Davis, a historian from the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. Please have a, have a seat. And as many of you will know, one of Germany's leading voices on Ukraine and on Central Eastern Europe. Uh, joining us also, Ralph Fuchs, director of the Center for Liberal Modernity here in Berlin. Ralph, please come and take a seat on the stage and likewise a leading voice on Ukraine and on defending democracy in Europe. 
And last but certainly not least, my colleague from the DGAP, Stefan Meister, head of the Center for Order and Governance in Russia and Central Asia and Eurasia. Um, all of them will be taking their reflections on what Yaroslav has said on the book. Um, and I would like them particularly to look at what is driving this Western reluctance to go in all in on Ukrainian victory, or even to give Ukraine what it needs to properly defend itself. What are the differences in assessment of the war and the stakes of the West? We've heard one assessment there. You've heard a take on my assessment briefly, but it would be interesting to hear where there are differences on that and what to do about all of this. Given we are where we are rather than where we would like to be, how should we best proceed? But I also want you to be able to bring your priorities into the discussion. So Francisca, first, please take a, take a few minutes to tell us your reflections on, on the book, on that talk and where we stand in Ukraine and how we can go forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having having uh, me to in this in this great panel. Um, I, as Ben, I would highly recommend reading the book. It really is a, a very important uh, work, and I would just like to highlight two things um, which really struck me. Um, the first one is that this book really shows you in detail um, that the decisions of human beings matter. They really make a difference. It makes a difference how you react to an attack. It makes a difference whether you uh, stay or leave. It makes a difference whether you believe in your own might or whether you do not. And I think all of this is shown um, in, 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 the, in this book. Uh, it, as I say, in, in great geographical detail also, it compares why um, Kherson first could not hold, but other places, Kiev, for example, could. And it was at, at the end of the day, it's the, the decisions taken by human beings. And I think this is so important because um, it proves not that that is longer necessary, but I think this is really a great illustration of this point. It proves, proves uh, Putin and all the so-called geopolitical analysis who think this is a, some kind of a power struggle between the East and, and the West, between Russia and America, between great empires, it proves them wrong. Because be, uh, behind this war of um, Russia against Ukraine is also, um, apart from the things you pointed out, um, is also the idea that small nations are first not real nations, and they are not able to act. They are not able to shape the, the course of history, the, their own destiny, that they, not only that they don't have the right to, which is, of course, also a conviction of, from people like uh, Putin and his his supporters, but also that they're just not able to. They they cannot do it. They're they're inferior in this in this respect. Only great empires led by great men can and should shape the course of history. And Ukrainians um, already proved that this was wrong in two thousand and fourteen. Um, they actually proved it, which is the, kind of the origin of, of Putin's uh, Ukraine trauma. They also pre proved it in 2003 uh, with the Orange Revolution. And this is also the reason why uh, the, the, the Russian elite were immediately convinced that it must have been the West behind these so-called color revolutions, but it, because it can't be that the quotation marks, little Russians, uh, Ukrainians, are actually able to to decide their destiny, to change the course of the development of their country. And this kind of repeated itself 2014, uh, 2013, 2014, the Ukrainians did manage um, to overthrow an, uh, an autocratic and kleptocratic um, regime. Um, and it's no coincidence that this was the point where the war actually started. Uh, one of the great tragedies, I, I, I think, is, is perhaps a, a, the, the right word in this, um, in this context, is that the West didn't notice. I think the misunderstanding of, of Maidan and what it was about was, was is, tells us very much about why so many people were surprised in 2022 about Ukrainian resilience. Why also they only really, or many people only really noticed Ukraine as a, as a culture, as a society, as a country with its own history, culture, traditions uh, in 2022. And that is really says, it's it, what it, it says a lot about the West and it, it doesn't say something good. It's 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 a bad thing. It, it should really make us think about um, ourselves. And the second remark about um, your book is um, going to be very short. It's just one sentence which really s touched me and made me really I don't know put the book down and 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 I it made me so sad. 
uh, when, you, when you wrote that you noticed in the first days of the full-scale invasion that the first people among the civilian population to flee were the people from Luhansk and Donetsk because they knew what Russian occupation meant. And that is, um, that is also so shameful. This, um, it's a kind of preaching to the converted in this room, but we could have known all this had, had we had more of us, I should say. Some people did pay attention, but had um, more people in politics, in media and society paid attention to what was uh, happening in between, in this so-called, this is also one of the things which makes this whole notion of a frozen conflict so, so wrong. A frozen conflict is not something that stands still. People keep dying and um, keep getting tortured, keep getting raped. And, and the people who had already fled their, their um, home city in 2014 in Luhansk and Donetsk, they knew this. So this is just what, what I'm going to say about this really important and excellent book. And I think the second thing, um, I, I shouldn't speak for too long, so I'm just going to say um, uh, very simple about what we have to do now. I'm not a military expert. I'm a historian. So it's, it's also an unusual role that I keep uh, talking about the present and also I'm constantly asked to speak about the future. Uh, I, I know why I became a historian because you know, everybody's dead and you have, know how everything ended and you can pretend to be very clever about it. Um, but um, it, I just really believe and it's what the military experts I trust say is that we need to give Ukraine what it needs to defend itself, what it needs to end uh, the Russian aggression and that this distrust, of, especially in Germany, towards Ukraine and its military is, is um, really a fatefully wrong um, decision. Uh, I, we're probably going to talk some more about that, so I'm just going, very briefly going to say what I think what is at the heart of, um, uh, of Germany's reluctance, which I can say most about, I guess. I think a very um, important point is what you said, Yaroslav, a lack of imagination, uh, what this would mean. I mean, it's one of the many reasons why, um, why people were surprised by the full-scale invasion was also because it seemed so anachronistic, uh, you know, a, a country on a kind of... Uh, pseudo historic mission to destroy another country because of some notions about history and it seemed so absurd like security concerns quote unquote seemed so much more rational i mean it's also an example of course of the success of kremlin propaganda kremlin propaganda in 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 the west but, but nonetheless um and i i think uh, in germany and in particular i think the problem lies in the um, social democratic uh, party is seems to me also to be a psychological one because they a lot of um, the decision makers in the social democratic party this is my hypothesis would have to accept that they were wrong about things more or less the last 30 years at least perhaps their whole life uh, notions of ostpolitik notions of detent which it is not even true. You can be for Willy Brandt in the 1970s, but the, the, the point is that you have to accept um, that the world has changed. But for, for some in, in, the, um, in the German government, at least, uh, this acceptance that many things um, you believed in, many things maybe perhaps you hoped for for Russia uh, are not true is obviously um, a very something that they, they fail to do, fail to understand. Thank you so much, Francesca. Yes, from failings of knowledge to failings of imagination and understanding, but also failings of empathy. And I think one thing that came across very much to me, again, from the book, but also from the debates of the last few years, is that emotion and morality do not need to be the enemies of good policy. They are part of good policy making. Understanding the stakes of this is extremely important. And understanding those stakes go all the way down to exactly people who'd already had to flee once and had to flee again. But not understanding that Ukraine actually had its right to belonging as a nation and to have the collective self-determination that was talked about before is then a failure of a mixture of emotion and understanding and and knowledge as well and i think it's really worth highlighting this point that agency matters agency matters on the individual level but also on the level of decision makers and on the level of societies and those smaller states which have actually often taken the lead in driving forward european policy uh, in the last two years are an exemplar of that ralph fuchs over to you yeah, <laughs> or to add, <clears throat> maybe I will start also with a uh, little bit deliberating on your comment that at the core of Western policy failures uh, towards Ukraine is a lack of imagination. I would agree that even 
after more than two years of this war, a lot of policymakers still have not come to the conclusion that this war will determine not only the future of Ukraine, that this is a determined, a, a determined uh, uh, event first for the future of the European peace order. If Ukraine fails, the European peace order is done. Second, that in Ukraine, the rule-based international liberal order is at stake. Yeah, if, if Russia succeeds with this kind of brutal attack, um, this order will be in shambles. So forget about uh, the Charter of the United Nations, forget about the Charter of Human Rights, forget about international law, uh, civilizing conflict and between states. And the third element, not less serious and not less frightening, is that also the future of the West is at stake. If we, the collective West, the, the community of liberal democracies, will allow Russia to run over Ukraine, I think this will be a trigger for the decline of the West as a political subject, which is able to protect democracy and the rule of law at home and abroad. And it will further erode the already shaken trust of our allies in the ability and the will of the West to defend them if they are attacked. And this will have a series of consequences. One of them will be the collapse of the nuclear arms uh, control regime. Because more and more nations, more and more states will come to the conclusion that the only last resort for their security will be nuclear arms. So this war is really, I would say, it's a crucial factor for the international, for the global political landscape in the early 21st century. And this has not trickled down uh, to the, the, the political mindset uh, of a lot of our then, political uh, leaders and also parts of, of uh, then, our population. They, th they still think they can contain this war and, and keep it a kind of regional distant event. So the second um, comment on this would be in political terms, it's not just a lack of imagination, it's a lack of unity and determination um, regarding the outcome, the end game of the war. There's obviously a deep divide in the West and in Europe, especially between Central Eastern European, Scandinavian, Baltic countries, maybe Great Britain, maybe now even France and other Western capitals, including Berlin. And I think the dramatic conclusion which German politics still has to um, take is that our approach, I would say the middle way approach of German politics, Ukraine should not lose, Russia should not win. This has failed, dramatically failed, unfortunately, in a war with a brutal opponent who is really determined to fight the war until the end. If you don't want to win, you are doomed to lose. This is the, the alternative we, we, we are facing and which the German policy still is shying away from because of a triple fear, fear of escalation, fear of collapse of the Putin regime, 
because of chaos and political anarchy in a nuclear state and fear of the own population, lack of political leadership. So what to do? <laughs> I'm not very optimistic in terms of German politics. I think my green friends in the government and the liberals missed a crucial opportunity, the parliament decision on Taurus, to make clear that um, they will not longer be blackmailed by the chancellor. Um, so I say my remaining hope to change the Western approach is the emergence of a kind of coalition of the willing um, between Poland, other Central Eastern European countries, Finland, Sweden, even Norway, Denmark, Great Britain, hopefully France. And maybe we will need some traumatic events to turn around European politics. What will our governments, what will our political leaders do if Kharkiv is occupied by a Russian army and Odessa is in immediate threat? What will they do then? Will they look away and give up? Or will this be, an, I would say, a turning moment yeah, that will trigger a more determined, a more resilient um, bank policy? Um, full engagement. And I think we are slowly approaching a point maybe when a majority of European governments will come to the conclusion that this is also our war. We cannot avoid that. Thank you. And this oh. could change the equilibrium. Thank you. This, this unfortunately is an all too familiar pattern, though. And Yaroslav and I were talking about this earlier that Ukraine had to wait for the world to know about the Butcher massacre to get artillery. It had to wait for the destruction of Mariupol as a city in order to get HIMARS and so on and so on. Why is it that we're continuing to wait? This is not strategic planning. And I think bringing together a couple of the comments that have been made there, we do have to embrace our power. Otherwise, others will surely embrace our weakness. And so why are we failing to take this strategic approach? Stefan, I'd be very interested to hear from you on this. Ralph outlined, there's, there's a coalition building. The Brits and the French can't quite yet get the messaging together with the money and the materiel that's needed, but they're coming on board with the same line now that Russia must be defeated in Ukraine that we've been hearing from the Central Eastern Europeans and from the Balts from the beginning. I mean, David Cameron and Stefan Sojourn were in the newspaper yesterday talking about exactly this. Is the pressure gonna become untenable on Berlin? Is Berlin going to crack and actually join the uh, the coalition of the winning? <laughs> I, I'm in this way. I'm more with Ralph Fuchs. Also, I don't have big expectations uh, towards this government. And um, mm -hmm. how to say it? I, just let me make also some 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 additional points and maybe bring this also a little bit um, together. Um, I think I, I just come back to what you, what you have said. Um, I think. Um, for me, the, the, and, and Francisca, I think how she started, and uh, this also leads to the book, for me, really the, the key point is, first of all, the difference between Ukrainian and Russian society. Um, uh, Ukrainian society acts as individuals, they have responsibility, um, they act as a nation, while Russian, Russian society acts under pressure by the state in the vertical of power, there's no responsibility. There's a cynicism also um, in, in 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 this society, and I think uh, I think this this point uh, she made um, how long we have seen both countries to the to to one lens, yeah, in a way. Um, I think that has somehow changed, in my opinion, and I think there is a different different understanding in a way uh, of Ukraine. But I think this defines really two two very different countries. Um, uh, and that's nothing which which just happened with this war. And I think this is this is also exactly what you described in the book, and what uh, the point you also made. Um, 
the energy, in my opinion, is in Ukraine. The energy is in, in, in Eastern Europe, is in, 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 in these countries, but it's not here. I think here we have fear societies, we have blocked societies in a way, afraid of losing, uh, losing welfare, losing their way of life. Um, and I have to travel to, to Ukraine, I have to travel to, to South Caucasus, to, to Moldova, to, to many of these countries, just to, to, to get my energy back in a way, yeah? Um, uh, and, and even if this country is on war, I think you, you see that this is a country which is is making a which has made a big change and is making a big change and i think this is this is also what this uh, what this book uh, book is about it but i think our elites reflect also very much society it's, so it's not i agree it's about about a lack of leadership it's a lack it's afraid of uh, for, for for the society um and and all the other points but i think it's also it these elites reflect also the society in in which we are um, and uh, and I think this is the responsibility maybe also of leaders and political decision makers, and that's why they are they are elected, but they also in a way uh, part part of this society. Um, what I think is one of the big failures in this whole uh, context for me is that we still don't understand the nature of the Russian regime, and we still don't understand. Um, how this regime kills inside of the country and outside of the country, which has has uh, emerged also as a as an increasingly totalitarian state, uh, and this war is changing Russia dramatically um, uh, in a way that it makes it even more dangerous. It's a regime which has no red lines. Uh, it's manipulating in a in a broad range uh, European and Western societies. Um, and we are just learning that there's disinformation, that there are cyber attacks. We're discussing these kind of things still as if there would be something new. Um, and it's something which happened since 15 years, since how many years? <laughs> it, it, they never stopped, maybe. Um, uh, so, and I think this is for me one of the big failures. We, we, un, we, 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 we still lacking the understanding of the character of an authoritarian, increasingly totalitarian regime, which has its roots. Uh, in the Soviet Union, um, and um, I think we have this refusal of reality, um, and we have a co wrong cost-benefit calculation. I think we have a constantly, and you you made this point also. What what would what would have ha what would have happened if we would have acted in a different way in in 2022? And it's about uh, imagination. What we can do, how we can change things, how Ukrainians have changed things, and how we can support them in making change uh, making this change. But it is also about um, uh, this refusal of, of a reality in which we are already since several years and which is just getting worse uh, because of the lack of action uh, and, uh, and the lack of leadership. Um, uh, so, and I think, again, I think this war is changing, changing Russia itself. Um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and I think we, we the longer we are waiting, the less we, we do, we respond in, in an adequate way, the more difficult uh, it will be also to, 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 to resist to this. So just, I just wanted to make this point because I think we, we always discuss about Ukraine um, and what Ukraine did, and this is really crucial, but I think we also have to understand the character of this, of this Russian regime. Coming to your, to your question, I agree. I think I also, I don't think it's France and Germany. I don't see that France is making the big difference, even if they, they maybe they have a they have a strategic culture, they understand uh, uh, what is bargaining, what is leverage, all these kind of things, how international politics functions. I'm not so sure about German decision makers and their understanding of these these, these fundamental principles, but I don't see uh, the leadership. I don't see the ownership also and and the, the ability of France to unite uh, other other uh, European uh, member states. I just don't think France has the soft power and the, the capability for this. I I would also I also promoting this this uh, because of the lack of leadership of the big countries. I think maybe we need a coalition of smaller countries of those countries who really understand the character of the Russian regime, who really feel the threat also of uh, uh, of coming from 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 Russia. Uh, who understand also in which situation Ukraine is, um, but you can also see how these countries are looking to Germany and to France, and uh, and how they are um, hoping that something happens here, a kind of a miracle happens here, 
Um, and I don't, I, I always tell them, look, you have to push us into the right direction. You have to take uh, maybe collective leadership to, 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 uh, to drag Germany and France also in, into this role. And I, I really think we have to think differently about leadership in Europe about how to organize leadership in Europe, how to organize support in, in, in Europe for, for Ukraine. Um, and, and yeah, and, and I think that might be the, the, the approach uh, to do it. But I, again, I think it's a, it's a matter of time. Uh, yeah, I think we are really under pressure now. Uh, uh, Ukraine is under pressure. It's really Russia understands there is a window of opportunity. Yeah, um, uh, and there will be provided more support, uh, weapons and ammunition. But um, but uh, yeah, I think uh, we need to start yesterday to make the, the change. Yeah, absolutely. But the second best time would be today uh, if we didn't do it yesterday, for sure. I mean, it's a really interesting point. How real is the French switch? Is the Bratislava agenda actually the French Titan vendor, a Titan vendor we could actually believe in? There's some in Central Eastern Europe who seem to buy that, who where it's making headway. Others still remain skeptical. This point about diffuse leadership in Europe, I think, is incredibly important as well. It relates to the point that we've made here at DGAP a number of times about team play, about letting different players play to their strengths. But that relies on the team having a common goal. And it's that, I think, that is currently fundamentally in question. Um, Yaroslav, we've had some brilliant comments there from our panel. I'll give you a chance to respond before we then go out to our audience, who I've promised the chance for questions and comments, so I will honor that promise. So if you could stick to five minutes in response as a max, and then we'll come to questions, which can also go to the panel as well as to Yaroslav. Sure. Uh, thank you so much. And you know, uh, we all share, I think, uh, concern and worry about the future as you know, events are I'm not necessarily developing in the right direction, uh, uh, but um, what you, the, the point you made about what struck you in the book about uh, how the people who experienced the Russian occupation, Donetsk and Lugansk, were the first to try to escape from Kiev, uh, speaks to his lack of imagination, because ordinary Ukrainians also could not imagine what was facing them. You know, Ukrainian society, the day before the war... Including Zelensky, we're still thinking that the war will be somewhere there in Donbas, will not come to Kiev, and uh, and they were you know catastrophically wrong, and you have the same mechanism now in Western societies who also think that, despite you know some people like you know the British Defense Secretary saying you know we're now in pre-war period, still no you know and and that speaks to this you know cost benefit calculations not just in retrospect, not about what happened in Ukraine. But also, you know, what would be the cost of Europe having to fight, you know, a full-scale war with an emboldened, uh, with, with an, you know, emboldened Russia that has Ukraine at its disposal, you know, two to five years from now, which is no longer something that is impossible to imagine, and it's now a factor of actual planning you know, for many, many Western militaries. And uh, I mean, you, you you spoke about what kind of catastrophic events uh, could happen, you know, the fall of Kharkiv. I still think that it's probably unlikely that Kharkiv uh, would fall absent an internal collapse of the Ukrainian society. Uh, but, you know, the war uh, will be much more difficult this year. You know, Russia clearly does sense, you know, this window of opportunity as American funding has ceased and European industrial capacity is not sufficient to supply Ukraine with ammunition. And they're going at it. You know, and I think fortunately... Uh, for Ukraine, the nature of warfare has changed with the technological developments and you know, the proliferation of drones uh, have made it easier to defend and, 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 and diminishes to an extent the, uh, the, the way in which Russia could utilize its advantages. But again, it's, it all has boundaries. And, uh, you know, I mean, Russia, the fact is Russia is advancing. It did seize, you know, one city. It could seize a few more this year, and uh, hundreds of people are dying every day. In terms of this understanding issue and imagination issue, again, something we spoke about before was that the generation of leaders who founded NATO seventy-five years ago this this month had generally experienced personally war firsthand. Think of Harold Macmillan, um, who served in the First World War, served in a, in a diplomatic capacity in the second. Think of Eisenhower. Think of that generation of leaders who understood viscerally what it meant 
to fight and why you needed to win. We don't have that generation now. What we have is a generation in Central Eastern Europe who grew up fighting against unfreedom, who grew up fighting against tyranny. And so that experience, that lived experience or recent memory experience is something we can draw on, I think, much more and much better um, if we are to shake our Western European societies out of our torpor a little bit, which needs to be done. And I wonder, drawing on what Ralph and Stefan and Yaroslav just said, if it would be enough were something awful to happen in Kharkiv or in Odessa to, start to actually shake us out of our um, our current approach, or does it actually take something happening much more directly to do it, by which time we've lost the battle of time at that stage already. So with that said, let's open up to the floor for comments and questions. Please, no grandstanding. Do briefly introduce yourselves and keep it to a punchy comment or question. We have one and two, please, to start with, and then three over there. Hello, everyone. Uh, Aaron Burnett, uh, co-host of Berlin Side Out. We talked, uh, Yaroslav, earlier, and one thing that we talked uh, earlier for our episode about was uh, the people-to-people -people contacts that happened uh, in between European publics and Ukrainian publics, certainly before the war, uh, because of you know visa liberalization, this sort of thing. Um, and I can't help but wonder if that was a little bit behind uh, the public opinion polling that we saw, that we've seen consistently um, throughout this war, where the public has actually, in, especially in Germany, interestingly run ahead of the government. The public is leading the government. The public was for uh, leopard delivery before the government was. The public was asked in one particular poll uh, whether it was willing uh, to pay more um, in goods uh, in order to support Ukraine. 74% of people said yes. So the question is, if Olaf Scholz in particular and the chancellery and our politicians are not able to hide behind public opinion as they claim to somehow be afraid to do, what explains their lack of leadership on this question if the public is already in fact on board? So that's a question uh, for anyone who would like to answer that one. Thank you very much. Please, could you pass the mic to the gentleman in the striped shirt? So please introduce yourself. That's Jeroen Schmidt, uh, former civil servant of the Foreign Office. Um, we always had formulated and still continue to formulate uh, Russia should be defeated. Where is the strategy? And you referred to the strategy of our political leaders, what should be done. If the strategy is yes, should be defeated, then we would have been forced to deliver a far more effective weaponry. But this is not a mistake to insist all the time, yes, we, we support, let's say, the Scholz formula as long as it takes, but not agreeing upon what is our final strategy. And the other question is, why do we not come forward with Russia shouldn't win? Let's say we should take away, let's say, from Russia the possibility to win over, but not all the time to insist still here to win against Russia. Because from my point of view, that is more or less out of sight. And to ask you, let's say, when we think all the time inside Germany, there's a lot of support, I have certain doubts about. Let's say we said, okay, we shouldn't let down Ukraine, but the population, if you ask, should we deliver that and that weaponry, we are far more careful, particularly in view of the elections coming forward. Thank you very much indeed. While the microphone makes its way over to the gentleman by the door, um, it is worth mentioning that that is precisely what Olaf Scholz has said. He said that Russia should not win and that Ukraine should not lose. That is the current position, which is a world away from saying Ukraine should win, of course. So, please. So, my question, part one, is regarding the closing window. Um, you discussed on the panel the threat of um, Ukrainian cities being retaken by Russian armed forces. And... I think we are not looking at something in the distant future. This is something that is closely ahead. So the threat is already there, um, which means, according to this, the discussion um, we are having on the panel, it's now the time um, one would have to act because we have a closing window of, of opportunity. I think the elections in the United States have not been that much discussed on the panel today, but I think this will have, it could have, a very um, deciding uh, influence on the situation in Ukraine if we would have a different US president in the next year. Um, and there's one more aspect I would like to, to raise is the question of economic power. Um, so if we look at the economic situation of the United West, 
it should not be a problem for the West to also win against Russia. Um, economically, Russia is a medium-sized power. So the question is, what does it need to um, get this economic power united? Thank you very much. Right. I mean, we have the ways. We just don't have the will. Um, down to the front, to Magdalena Kirchner, please. And then we will come to our panel to, to respond. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Magdalena. I'm the head of the Europe in the World pro uh, program at Stiftung Mercator. Um, Yara, I wanted to ask you a question, not only in your role as an excellent author, a wonderful book, but also as a journalist, and maybe come back to the question of Ukrainian agency, because we talked a lot about Western support. And obviously, you said it quite um, artistically, I would say. Ukraine receives, even like decision makers receive a lot of um, kind words and statements that uh, infer morality and moral support. But when you look to the policies, it's more the cynicism that you described in the beginning and containment, like as long as red lines are not pushed wherever they are, uh, we can manage and handle this, which of course I imagine creates for the Ukrainian government an extreme limbo and uncertainty while a war is going on. So um, in the news, we saw like some lowering of the um, the recruitment age. But what are the responses? Like, what is the Ukrainian government leadership in the war actually going to do in this situation? How do you uh, anticipate if the, the dilemma that was discussed on the panel is not changing? Uh, the Ukrainian government still has to act because the war is a reality. So, what will be um, your predictions for the future in the conflict? Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Yaroslav, first, please. And then could panelists please volunteer to address those those questions? So, Yaroslav. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I will, uh, maybe I'll start with the easiest question about the uh, economic might of the collective West. How big was the economy of Mongolia before Genghis Khan conquered half the known world? GDPs don't win wars. It's It's the amount of sacrifice and determination that you want to make and the ability of your people to die and the russian population seems to be okay so far at least on the on sort of on the surface with hundreds of thousands of people dying you know this level of casualties would not be acceptable to western societies uh and so we shouldn't lull ourselves into thinking that just because russia's economy is smaller than spain's it doesn't have the muscle to potentially threaten uh, the rest of europe uh now, uh, when we talk about um, what is what is the outlook for Ukraine losing territory, and what uh, what the Ukrainian government can do uh, as as the Western aid, uh, as the American aid has basically ceased, right? We haven't seen any major U.S. Uh, deliveries uh, since January. So you already don't have to wait for the U.S. election. You already have the uh, you know, Trump and, and the Trump wing of the Republican Party determining American policy by effectively ending American military support for Ukraine in terms of at least goods. I mean, the US, the U.S. still provides intelligence and other support, but the ammunition is not coming or coming in very small numbers. No, right. I mean, I heard a joke from a Ukrainian friend recently who said, with friends like Jake Sullivan, who needs enemies like Donald Trump? Um, which might be slightly overstating the case, but nonetheless, the point remains. Maybe the election is already priced in. Well, it's not priced in. I mean, but it's it's a factor that they have to deal with. And you know, again, when we uh, spoke about the indecision of the German government and this whole debate, should Russia win, not win, should Ukraine win? I think the German policy is very closely uh, aligned with the policy of the Biden administration. Uh, there isn't that much daylight. You know, I mean, with the Germany doesn't want to send Taurus missiles, with the U.S. refused to send ATA camps, when the U.K. and France did send cruise missiles. And I think this presumption that you could somehow you know, modulate the outcome of a war, you know, not to call it, not to call the sort of Goldilocks policy to war, uh, which was pursued by the White House, uh, can only be pursued by people who have never actually seen a real war and don't understand the, the you know, that if you fight a war, you have to fight it to win. Uh, so um, again, uh, it's tough for the Ukrainians, but let's also see the situation on the ground russia so far in the past year well since may last year took one town of mm. you know at the at the cost of tens of thousands of soldiers and hundreds of pieces of equipment 
uh, Ukraine is trying to counteract the shortage of ammunition, which is a structural shortage. It's not that the Europeans can do much more because they just the capacity is not there to offset. It will be there next year, potentially, but uh, there's just not enough. And so Ukraine, one of the strategies is to uh, rely on drones as an alternative to, to artillery. And Ukraine uh, has a capacity, you know, you know, Antonov, you know, the, air, the airplane maker is now making drones and they have been very successful. If you watch these videos that now pop up every day on Telegram of Russian columns trying to advance, uh, you know, drones take out a large part of them. And you, know, you can now use a $300 drone to be a precise precision guided weapon uh you know it's one tenth of the price of, of an ordinary artillery shell let's uh, thank you very much indeed and yes that discussion of what is a drone and what is a small cruise missile powered by a jet engine is increasingly taking off in expert circles but francisca surely this this discussion about the will and the way that came up and russia's being willing to bear more casualties and so on. This is somehow the flip side of that argument about agency of smaller states as well, isn't it? It's not so much the uh, size of the dog in the fight as the size of the fight in the dog that matters. Yes, but I, I, um, I mean, the what one th or the many things which now um, is different between Ukrainian and Russian society is that for the Ukrainian government a human lives not only matter but they're also a political factor and in russia this is not the case human human lives uh, are worthless uh, from the point of the russian government and that of course allows russia to employ uh, different strategies and tactics uh, than ukraine nonetheless in the long run i would i'm still convinced um, that this is a strength of course of ukraine that it values and it's the reason for its survival that that, that human lives um, are valued but i would like to comment on, on on two aspects which were brought up from the from the audience number one the question of the relationship between uh, political leadership and public opinion it's a bit of the um kind of hen and egg question right i mean you don't really know if we had more political leadership would the public think differently i mean that that is um, that is something is question which is obviously hard to answer but i i i do think if the let's say very um kind of um politely if the communication strategy of the government was different uh, maybe they would have a, a like larger part of the populace on their side and another aspect in this is of course also the the way these opinion polls are framed um i always get a bit um quite annoyed when i, when I read opinion opinion poll oh opinion yeah poll uh, asking asking respondents uh, are you in favor of ukraine um putting forward more di diplomatic efforts uh, and then uh, I, I always think, well, why don't you ask, are you in favor of Ukraine surrendering to a genocidal Russian regime? Because this is what this means at present with, with what uh, the declared uh, aim of, Russian, uh, of the Russian state and the Russian army are. And the, the, the question um, about the reasons for the lack, in particular in the Social Democratic Party, about um, you know, why it is not embracing this uh, notion that ukraine must win i um i i think two factors play a decisive role one is still this idealization of ostpolitik i do really think that this is very important this this um um this idea that you can take the ostpolitik from the 1970s and the 1980s and apply it to the present which of course misses several points one of which is that brand's ostpolitik most obvious point took place in the cold war when the when um you know the world was very different it also misses the point that brand knelt in warsaw and not in moscow so east central europe central eastern europe was a factor for him uh, and it misses that already in the 1980s, these kind of um, this kind of uh, state and Moscow centered, perhaps in particular government centered approach, you know, of dealing with dictatorships at the end of the day, uh, came at a cost um, of, uh, uh, of solidarity with the societies who were living under this dictatorship. So already in the 1980s, when Solidarność emerged in the in Poland, the politics of um, uh, Ostpolitik uh, became 
well, at least a, um, a dilemma. And in Egon Barr, famous, well, not it's not famous, it should be famous, but he, he said in 1980, peace, oh, he wrote in 1980, he, 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 he said it was his American acquaintance, but, you know, uh, not quite sure about that. He said, um, peace is more important than Poland. And, and this kind of um, cost of um, Ostpolitik um, has not reached the SPD, the Social Democratic Party, because it's also... Um, more or less, um, if, if you're a bit mean, the last great success of the Social Democratic Party. And they, they, it's also why they blow it all out of proportion. And I, mean, I read an interview with uh, Frank Walter Steinmeier, our, ven, our then foreign um, secretary, in 2014, at the end of 2014, after Ukraine attacked, uh, Russia attacked Ukraine, um, where he, um, he, he was only speaking about Ukraine as the origin of a crisis. And the rest of the interview was about how much he longed for good Russian German relations. Um, and also, um, and I, I still, many have not overcome this. I'm sorry, I'm just going too long. Not at all. There's a lot to say. We do understand that, but we'll give some of our other guests the okay. chance to say it too. One other key difference to point out between those two times is that Brandt's last policy came at a time when Germany was spending between three and 4% of GDP Absolutely, on yeah. defense and was part of a NATO that was armed to win. Ralph, and then Stefan. The comments first on also public opinion chairman i think you gave a little bit too positive reading of uh, the public opinion in germany of course it's true that we have still a solid majority which is in favor of military support for ukraine even of increased military support of, uh, of ukraine but if you ask people are you in favor of delivering um, aircraft, or the jet fighters, Taurus, you have a majority against. Because of what? Because uh, Scholz's arguments are resounding in the population that our cautious policy yeah, is protecting Germany, keeping us out of the war. And it was a very calculated, I would even say Machiavellistic move of Scholz to present himself as Pien's chancellor, as the one who uh, will uh, keep Germany out of the war. And this resounds very much in, in our population. And you will not be able to counter it if you... Um, uh, will start a campaign. Yes, we we uh, have to engage in this war militarily. No, it's the other way around. I think we have to criticize Scholz that his policy, paradoxically or even tragically, will increase the risk of an all-out war in Europe. That he's not securing peace for Germany, he's endangering German and European uh, security. This is the key point in the in, in the argument and the second comment on economics of course you are totally right uh, war is not just about economic potential but first it is a shame really a shame that more than two years after the start of the full-fledged invasion we still are not able to produce the necessary amount of ammunition to secure the continuous influx of materials uh, into in, into to Ukraine. And this is part of this general hesitancy. You can say postponed Zeitenwende. We are not really serious in investing than in uh, European uh, security. And the other angle or the other part of the economics, of course, are sanctions. Yeah? tightening the sanctions and preventing Western, European, German, it's also a problem of the US companies to deliver militarily significant technologies to Russia and keeping the Russian arms industry running. And I would add, confiscating the assets of the Russian State Bank is another element which would be a signal that we are really going serious. And the third element is to um, create incentives for 
well-educated Russian specialists to leave the countries. Yeah, we, we I, I think we should really apply a policy of brain drain against uh, the, 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 the Russian regime that would weaken uh, their ability to, um, to continue the war for the next years. Thank you, Ralph. And yes, it's not often that Olaf Scholz is confused with Machiavelli, but uh, nonetheless, you heard it here tonight. Um, but the question is, what again, much like the Russian war tactics, what might be successful in the short term may not actually serve your long term interest and may not be the right thing to do in that regard. So the question as to what is politically or on a partisan basis a successful or cunning policy versus what's actually serving the national interest, I think, really comes into, into play there. And this notion of signaling that you mentioned about seizing Russian assets and so on, that would signal the will to win, signal the will to defend our, our societies and our democracies. But this will to keep out of the war, that's signaling fear and that's signaling that we would back off. So where is the limits to that backing off, any reasonable enemy may, may ask. Stefan, please, over to you. Okay, just take, I just wanted to respond to, to also your question, what is the final strategy? And um, uh, I don't think uh, it's about defeating Russia. I don't think that this is our goal. Um, uh, and I don't think we have a final strategy, definitely not. Um, and we had recently, I don't know if you, I have been there, we had a, the political director of the, of the foreign office here talking about, uh, mainly about Ukraine and Russia. Um, and she had a very sophisticated analysis, understands everything. But then if you ask about what is the German strategy, uh, we are blank, yeah, in a way. Uh, we are we doing crisis management and we don't have a strategy. Um, and in the end, I think we expect uh, on one point a deal with Russia because we cannot win a war against Russia. I think this is the, this is the perception, uh, in, in, in my opinion. Um, and the second point I just wanted to make um, uh, quickly, I think we also have to understand for Russia, this is still not a total war. Russia is st still not uh, um, um, uh, uh, bringing all, all its resources into this war. It's still not in a full-fledged war economy. It has not mobilized the whole society. Um, it's even outsourcing the production of uh, ammunition and, and, and drones. Um, uh, but at the same time, it's building, the regime is building its legitimacy around the war. So the war is becoming a system immanent uh, for the Russian regime. And, and this is something which should threaten us uh, in a way, because I think it, um, it has no interest to stop the war, but it still has resources to, to mobilize and to, to, to switch maybe to uh, even more danger uh, to, to, to this kind of war. And it will, not, it will not stop because we make compromises. Yeah, and I think we had the question here about how to create a win-win-win situation. I'm afraid of it's the wrong question because the Russian regime logic is there's only win-lose. There is no win-win. I think we Germany tried with its Ostpolitik for with its new Ostpolitik. Yeah, we have two Ostpolitics. It tried it tried win-win in a way, uh, but it we have to understand there's only win-lose from a Russian perspective, and I think that's the problem. Um, uh, we, and we have a psychological problem here because we really want win-win, and I'm also I also want win-win. I'm also uh, it's terrible what happens also in Russia with the society with the repressions and everything. Um, not compared to Ukraine, definitely, yeah. But this is a win-lose regime, and this is the, this is something we have to deal with. We have to calculate, uh, and we we have to think about it. And it's getting more costly, yeah. So uh, uh, when we don't act, and, and 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 I think this is something we still haven't realized, in my opinion. Right. I mean, wars don't tend to be win-win. That's one of the key lessons that I think we forgot. So, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, this is the point. And we've lost that thinking. And this this is part of the sort of arrogance of Western Europe post-war. It was literally to make itself post-war and post-victory. Francisca, we're going to come to you for one very quick remark. And then we've got one more question I can see in the audience. Two, three. We're going to only take those. And they have to be really quick. And then we're going to come back for a last remark to uh, Yaroslav. And I'm going to push back very quickly on that question of strategy. Just a, a short comment, but I think I think this is also important. I think the Germany's re, the response of some German politicians is not only about fear. I mean, fear plays a role, but it's also fundamentally an unaddressed issue of a tradition of a joint German-Russian imperialism at the cost of Central Eastern Europe. And when you look at some of the um, things said in the Bundestag recently in the tariffs debate, this was really a tradition of basically accepting still in some ways that at the end of the um, day, Moscow must get some 
of uh, its aims realized. And of course, then we come to this, what you raised. Uh, it's not possible if, if the goal is what Russia's goal are right now. Sorry. No. Thank you. Let me push back on this strategy point just quickly, and then we'll come to those questions, because this is something we've been working on a lot at DGAP. After the German position has been for this long held in this pattern, one has to conclude it's not a lack of strategy. That is the strategy. It might be a bad strategy, but it is the strategy. So what is it a strategy of? A strategy of preservation, of preserving as much of the world of yesterday as you can, of clinging on to the world that, fair enough, Germany did extremely well from after the end of the Cold War. And so to hold on to as much of that as you possibly can in a changing world, I think is something we could consider. And there's not only bad elements to that. You can question, there are worlds, aspects of that world that are worth trying to preserve. The question is, can you do that and cling on to the other things that actually matter to the democratic societies of the world at the same time? So I think the question of strategy less versus bad strategy is one that actually needs to be addressed a little more. Okay, very quick, please introduce yourself. Question up at the back. Then we had one right here, and there was one more lurking, this, this lady next to you. So we'll take this one and those two. Thanks. Okay? Uh Joshua Yaffa from The New Yorker. I have a question about mobilization. Uh, Ukrainian military officials point, of course, to the um, equipment and munitions problem. That's uh, freely for the West to decide. But they also say they're, the other problem of equal size uh, is the manpower question in Ukraine. Um, Ukrainian parliament struggles to pass mobilization law. It seems like after two years, those who were most eager to join the fight already have done so. It's getting harder and harder to, to find uh, new men to fight. We've talked about Ukraine is not Russia, so it's not you have to take into social and political factors uh, Ukraine has to weigh when it thinks about who it drafts and how and at what scope. And so the question for Yaro is, how have you seen the manpower question play out uh, in your reporting in the field past the scope of the book? Uh, and do you think Ukraine has a solution military, political, social uh, to this issue, it seems stuck uh, for some time in trying to address this problem. Is there a way out? Uh, Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, quickly to the other two questions, and then we'll give Yaro another hour and a half to answer that one. Uh, it's very good, very important question. But these two here, please, Lima, thank you. Yeah, thank you. My name is Christa Maria Lebe. I'm with Vice, and I have a question about this win-win perspective and strategy from a German perspective, because I think we also need to understand from Ukraine perspective, it's also win-lose. Like even if we have a ceasefire, it's lose for Ukraine and Ukrainians. So I really struggle to understand how we even can think about that we want or we could want in some scenario have a win-win situation here or have we don't have a total war yet. I think the situation as it is, and I speak here as someone who has family still in Ukraine, is worse enough. We have people in forced um, camps. We have 20,000 children um, deported and, and so on and so on. I think everyone on the panel and in this room knows the scenario. So I don't think any one of us wants to see a total war of Russia because that would mean for the perspective of Ukrainians, a total, total destruction of our yeah, of our people. And therefore, what do we need to do as Ukrainians to convince the Germans, like policymakers and also the society that there is no option for win-win with Russia, because it will be always win-lose if Russia does is not defeated. So this is my question, um, especially to Stefan Meister and in general to the panel. Thank you very much. Next and last question. Keep it brief, Doug Buzzfind. Politico formerly of Reuters in Moscow. Um, failure of imagination. What's the postscript to your book? Uh, if things continue, uh, you know, what would you be writing as you address political leaders in countries like Germany? Where are we going to end up? Uh, you know, help us with your powers of ob observation and our deficit in imagination. Thank you. Splendid. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give one sentence or thereabouts to each of our panelists and then leave the last word to you, Yaroslav. Stefan, first, one was particularly addressed to you, so please uh, jump in, but do keep it quick. I think it's a psychological problem, to be honest. I think we cannot imagine um, uh, something else than win-win in a way. And and I think part of this imagination, maybe it's an imperial, uh, you can argue it's an imperial thinking, but it's 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 not only this. I think it's it's you know, you have also the argument not more people should die, and then there's a wrong logic also how, how it should work. Yeah, but I think we can just not imagine that 
um, uh, to win a war against Russia. I think it's also from the German history coming. <laughs> and for, uh, and, and, and uh, yeah, so I think that this is a problem uh, uh, in a way. Um, uh, but I think it's 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 very difficult to 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 explain how this functions. So I tried this since twenty five years to explain how the Russian system functions, and we we have our own interpretation and and it's again it's it's for me also this refusal of realities, but it's also the way we are able to imagine others uh, and 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 and, and the Russian system. So I I'm I'm very skeptical about to change this this paradigm because you. You always get this question. You always have this imagination, um, and I don't see really a change on this. Uh, yeah, so we we have a okay. I, we have to say we have a lot of changes of politics in Germany, but we don't have a mental change, um, and we don't really uh, understand the the, the 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 nature of of many of these uh, things we just discussed. Thank you, Stefan. Um, indeed, the world has changed its impression of Germans over the years, though. At different times so i wonder if these are not impossible processes actually after all ralph to you please to your two sentences Tr slightly short another sentences. another short answer or try uh, to eva maria's um, question um i think the di dilemma or the challenge we are facing is to convince the german public and uh, the german political class that we must go for a military defeat in uh, of, of Russia in Ukraine without increasing the risk of an all-out war. Yeah, um, including uh, the use of uh, tactical nuclear weapons uh, by Moscow and all the other uh, potential of destruction they are still commanding, as, as Stefan said. And I think the answer to that dilemma is deterrence classical deterrence telling putin don't do that otherwise the consequences mm -hmm. will be devastating for russia so instead of all the time considering what are the red lines of putin we have to respect we have to draw red lines to the russian regime Absolutely right. Yes. And not only telling, but showing, having the credibility to back up that deterrence. Francisca, sentence to you. I'm giving my sentences to Yaroslav. Very generous. Yaroslav, over to you. Well, I'll, I'll start by answering the question, a very difficult question about uh, mobilization and Ukrainian um, capacity to field soldiers for the fight. It is true that uh, on both sides in this war, much of the professional military that existed uh, two years ago is dead or injured. It's true that a lot of the volunteers who flock to fight uh, are no longer able to fight. Uh, it's also true that there are political issues with mobilization because it's very un unfair. You know, there's a lot of people being taken off the streets in small towns that don't matter politically and hardly anyone I know in Kiev who's been uh, forced to fight mm -hmm. because that would provoke a political backlash. And Ukraine being a democracy, parliament has been stuck in negotiating all that. But having said all that, you know, Ukraine still has a huge pool of uh, potential soldiers. And people who don't necessarily want to die for Avdiivka will go and fight for Kharkiv or Kiev. So if, if, if the tide of the war were to change dramatically, I would see also a much larger influx uh, of volunteers, which is still happening now. You know, just as an example, you know, the person who designed the website for my book you know, once he finished the job, you know, went off to fight in the army as a volunteer. So uh, speaking about the um, the question of what next, and uh, I mean, I certainly hope I don't have to write a book about, you know, full-scale war in Europe in two, three years in time, if we all survive that. Um, but what struck me most, uh, and, and you spoke about history and how, you know, the lessons of history are determining German policy now, is uh, in this conflict how much badly learned history uh, is affecting decision making on all sides? And you see it in Russia, where right. you know, Putin spent you know his time in COVID isolation, reading all the wrong books about Ukrainian and Russian history and drawing wrong conclusions about you know the unity and of the two peoples and how the Ukrainians will not resist. You also have the badly learned history of World War II in Germany. 
because it was not a war with Russia. It was a war with the Soviet Union in which proportionally a lot more Ukrainians died fighting the Nazis than Russians. Uh, and to Ukrainians, uh, and I mentioned this, this in the book, you know, when the German foreign minister came to Kiev uh, a few days before the full-scale invasion and uh, was, was asked, why are you blocking weapon supplies to Ukraine and even blocking the Estonians from reselling to uh, providing to Ukraine, you know, the GDR, uh, you know, origin howitzers. Uh, she said, well, you know, we have a particular history, uh, you know, you must understand. And Ukraine is like, what, what does it mean? You know, you know, our people died by the millions in the war that Nazi Germany instigated. You know, I have family members who, who died in that. And so the lesson you have drawn is you should not help us defend ourselves. And I think, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the power of history to determine mm -hmm. it, it plays in this conflict. It's something that we don't pay enough attention to, but we, we should. We certainly should. And it's not only the uses of history, but the abuses of history or the particular readings of history that are then instrumentalized to purposes like this. One advantage of being a Brit is that you grow up learning that war is awful, but sometimes necessary in order to stop fascist expansionary dictators. And that has to be a recovered learning that I think we have here. But for those who want a first draft of history uh, in a very interesting way, or a second draft of history, the book is available to buy outside. Uh, it's also available on Kindle and on audiobook. And I highly suggest, if you haven't read it yet, that you will go out and do so. And I hope tonight has whetted your appetite for doing that. Thank you for being such a wonderfully engaged audience. Thank you to our panel. And thank you to Yaroslav Trofimov, to the DGAP, and to the Stiftung Mercato, who made this possible. Please join me in thanking our guests for tonight. Thank you.